Hi, I'm Rajiv, and... Honk, honk. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Rajiv, and today is part three of my Halloween costume saga, meeting with Alexa for the fitting of the toile. How many parts do you think your Halloween costume will have? Probably 14 <laughs> or 17. <laughs> We're going to lose track of them. Alexa, this is your sewing machine? This is my work sewing machine. And how many things do you think you've made on this machine? Oh gosh, I've been here almost a year and a half now, and it's probably up in the 50s at least. Nice. Yeah. When was this made? Um, do we know? I'm not sure. Just based on the look of the model, I'd say it's probably around 1970s. OK. Mm -hmm. So my mom had a little side business making curtains while I was growing up, like since I was a very small kid. And she had a machine just like this in the basement. It was a Juki machine uh, made in Japan. And that was the machine that I learned how to sew on. So the thing about these machines is they are very powerful. This machine is very different compared to a home sewing machine, which when you learn how to sew on this and then you go to a home sewing machine, the home sewing machine feels like a toy. So I just asked Alexa if she could just demonstrate this machine so you could hear the power. The, the pedal is another thing about this machine that you have to really get used to. Definitely, it's, it's very touch sensitive and each machine is calibrated in different ways. That's how fast it can go. Um, compared to domestic, it's quite fast. It also just feels very strong. It is. It can go through so many layers, so many more layers than a domestic machine. That's um, based on the motor power. So I'm folding this, and that's. Like you could sew denim on this, right? You could. Like multiple yes. layers of denim. You could even denim. sew leather on here, depending on the foot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the power of the motor makes the feed dogs be able to handle this many layers. Yeah. So that's that's something that's really kind of crucial when you're making clothing with all different material, and and you really want uh, to be able to sew it properly so that it's held together securely. These industrial machines are are kind of vital, and I don't have one in my apartment in New York, so uh, for this doublet, it's going to be all hand sewing, which is what they would have done in the 15 and 1600s, but I did, I did just want to show everyone um, where you actually do your sewing, because yeah. this is, this is kind of sentimental to me, because this is how I learned how to sew, so. I've said this before, I have some kind of weird attraction to irons. Like since I was a little kid, <laughs> the iron always just appealed to me. That sounds dangerous. <laughs> it, it, it was, it was actually dangerous because m I always wanted to play with the iron that my parents would use and my mom would say, no, like you, that's not a toy. And because I was a brat and I would throw tantrums and stuff, uh, she would say, okay, fine, you can play with it, but you're not plugging it in. And I was like two, two or three years old. And once, when they weren't around, I was playing with it and I plugged it in because I knew how to plug it in. And then I left it on the carpet and left it there and it burnt a hole through the carpet. And they, they ran up like, what's smoking? And it was this whole thing. And that burnt mark on the carpet was there for the 15 years that we lived in that house. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <laughs> Bad. This space is is just for ironing and this is where Alexa irons the cloth before she cuts it out or in the process of making a garment and the, 
Alexa, can you tell us about these actual irons, like how they work? So please? this is an industrial gravity iron, and um, the gravity part of it comes from the water tank that's up there, and that's um, how we get the steam, whereas most domestic irons, it's holding the steam within the base. Okay. Um, because it travels farther and because of the weight of it, it just distributes the steam more evenly. Mm -hmm. There's no, t is there a temperature setting on the iron? There actually is a temperature setting on the iron, but um, for the most part, you don't need to mess with it because it's better at adjusting itself to different fabrics than a domestic iron is. So with a domestic iron, you want to be using the highest heat setting for cotton yep. and maybe a median heat setting for a silk mm -hmm. like this. But um, with that, you don't need to continuously adjust. So. so this kind of iron is actually something that my mom didn't have. And it was, I think it was the only sort of piece of the puzzle in her industrial endeavor making um, curtains that she didn't have. She had big cutting tables, she had the industrial sewing machines, she had the fabric shears that were very heavy, but we had a home iron and it, it, it was a lot of work mm -hmm. like to actually get things ironed properly, whereas this, it happens so quickly, right? Yeah, definitely. This is more conducive to um, a studio setting and um, just lots and lots of work on it. And that's why we have the ironing table as well, so that stuff can be spread out as flat as you possibly need. And without even adjusting the temperature, you're going from cotton to silk and it's not burning it. Exactly. Some of you probably have never seen these things as part of ironing, but going, going back like 500 years, garments were shaped not only by sewing them, but by pressing them. So the tailor or the seamstress would, would sew the cloth in a certain way. And what Alexa has done here is she's created a dart, which is right here. And, and a dart creates the sort of curvature to the garment, like this, this dart right here is necessary to go over the bust. And maybe Alexa, you can show them how, with this dart that you've sewn, how the ham is used. So I cut open my dart so that I have equal amounts of fabric on either side. Um, and, oops. And that's just nice for pressing because then it becomes really flat once mm -hmm. you've pressed it. But and then you take your ham, that's what this is called, a, a ta tailor's ham. I take my ham and find the curve that it's gonna be pressed to. And I press out my dart with either side of the fabric up, up to the point. And then it's always good to press both sides. And so I have a really smooth, subtle curve in my fabric now. So there's a dart here, and there's a dart here, and what that has done, like this is very small, but if this creates a, a shape to the garment that if I had boobies, <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is what would be necessary to shape this, to, to fit that. So this. Making it's one thing, but then pressing it, and this is so, I just think this is so beautiful that all these curves are used for different things, right? Like different parts of shaping the cloth. Definitely. Beautiful. Can you show us what this is for, please? So this one's a clapper, and... A clapper? I, yes, and okay. I use it a lot as a tailor because we're working with wools that tend to be a little more spongy and bouncy like this. Yep. Um, and... What it does is when you're pressing, the steam is going into your fabric. Mm -hmm. And it's going to compress the fabric down more than you're able to with just the iron. So I clap it while it's still hot. And all that steam is going up into the wood and being absorbed by it quicker than if I just let it cool and dry. Mm -hmm. And then when I pull it off, it's much flatter. Ah, so it's like a crisp. It creates a very crisp edge and yeah. crisp shape, and that's good for like lapels, turning anything out, bagging things, the um, edges of hems, so that mm -hmm. all that fabric is just real flat. And compressed. Mm -hmm. Clapper. Clapper. Okay. And, and without that, like if you just ironed it. Without that, you know, even using as much strength as I can to push that down, it's not cooling quite as fast. Mm -hmm. So see how it still stays quite bouncy. Yep. 
as opposed to that. This part's really exciting. Alexa has drafted the pattern for my doublet and it's all to size and she's marked my measurements. I think I have, do I have Marilyn Monroe's measurements? 34, 29? <laughs> oh, definitely. 34? <laughs> <laughs> Lovely hourglass. I've always thought so. Right? That, that's pretty, that's pretty hourglassy, right? Mm -hmm. 34 chest, 29 waist. <laughs> let's, let's do a little primer for people. When fabric is being woven, the way it starts is that threads are put onto the loom and that's called a warp. And, and if, you, if you need to weave 12 yards of cloth, historically, they would put on 12 yards of thread as the warp or 14 because you have some waste. So once the loom is threaded with the warp, then they actually take the shuttle and they weave back and forth. And that's called the weft. The weft runs across the warp back and forth. When the weft goes over, under, over, under, over, under all the warp threads, as it's going in and out, what it's doing on the very last part of the warp, it's creating a locked edge, and that is called the selvage. I love nerding out on this. So I think a lot of people out there have heard of like selvage denim. And salvage denim is when you turn your jeans inside out and you look on this, this edge right here and you see the finished edge of the cloth. And sometimes if they're intentionally weaving denim for, for salvage jeans, they put like a red thread in there or, yes. or they finish <laughs> the edge with a different colored thread so that you can see that that's the selvage. If you were to lay this out on onto this cloth, like what would be your process? You don't have to lay it out on uh, like on the grain, but just to show viewers. So the rule of thumb is you find your selvage edge, and selvage edges um, should always run up and down the body. Um, so that's going to be your narrower width of fabric, and mm -hmm. then your yardage is the other direction. And I've drafted my patterns where um, on this dot paper, that's my grain line. So this is your center back. Center back and center fronts, generally, you want to keep on the straight. Mm -hmm. So I would find my selvage edge and arbitrarily, you know, pick how much room I'm going to need for my seam allowance. And I'm going to say that I want that center back on the straight nine inches from the edge of the fabric. So I'm measuring over here, I'm pinning it down, and then I'm making sure that at the bottom it is also nine inches away from that selvage edge. It's very important that the pattern piece is put on a certain direction of the cloth because if it's put in the wrong direction, it, it won't lie on your body properly. And this is the b fascinating beauty of creating clothing is for thousands of years, man has figured out how to, how to actually adjust the cloth to make it flattering on the body. So that, that aspect of this is, is why Alexa is paying so much attention to where the center back is placed because placing it right here is what's gonna enable this cloth to actually follow the very beautiful curve of my back. <laughs> <laughs> You've laid this out. Now, would you fit the pieces to economize on the fabric? Um, it depends. So that's called nesting when you're trying to economize as much fabric as possible. Say I'm putting this here and I want to try to get a tab and the tabs are actually going to be on the bias. So I would try to fit one in there. Really? Mm -hmm. Those are cut on the bias? Yes. So, so the bias is the diagonal. Mm -hmm. And why do we put things on the bias? Just so they know. So when um, something's on the bias, it curves better over the body because you're getting that cross section of where the fibers are weaving like this and there's the ability to stretch a little bit more and that can be tricky to work with because it's not as stable as when you're um, sewing on the warp or the weft. So let's show them this. If I pull the cloth in the direction in which it was woven, right, like this way. There's barely any give. Barely pull. If I pull it this way, like this, across, there's not a lot of Even pull. less so. Right? This is across the uh, weft. But now, look what happens when I pull it diagonally. Look at, look at how much stretch there is. This is not a stretchy fabric. This is, there's, no, there's no nylon or stretch stuff woven into this. This is pure linen and wool. But this 
pulling it on the bias allows it to stretch. So the way you take advantage of that when you want something to curve is you put the pattern piece on the bias and you, you cut it on the diagonal. So that's these, these pieces right here are the tabs on the doublet that are going to go all around the tabs. And those tabs, like this is going to be curving around my waist. So we would not put it this way. We would not put it this way. We lay it on the bias. Fascinating. Well, here we are, and Alexa Figueres, a very skilled tailor, has created something that has kind of blown my mind. Because when you said you were going to make a toile, I just, in my head, I thought it would be something that was very simple. This ain't simple. <laughs> Alexa, will you, will you please bring him in? Of course. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> this this is the twelve. And to me, I'm kind of wondering if the Halloween costume is done. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I could just wear this. This is so beautiful. I can't believe you made this. Thank you. <laughs> so can can you please explain to me what exactly has gone into constructing this? Because I just assumed you, you were just gonna use plain muslin. But I see here there's so much more than just muslin. Why? This is where my job as a tailor comes in because menswear is meant to be sculptural and smooth like this. So I can't just give you the limp floppy fabric because it's not gonna sit the same way that your finished garment will. So I've basted in all this HIMO with tailor and canvas. Um, historically, it's been made out of linens, cotton, horse hair. Um, and it creates this beautiful strong shoulder and this sculptural look where hopefully when we're fitting it on you, it's not going to wrinkle at all. It's just going to look like a smooth, beautiful piece. So all of this stuff on the inside is what gives it shape. Correct. So this is the doublet. That's the 17th century top part of a man's garment and these are called the the trunk hose the trunk hose mm -hmm. and alexa was explaining to me that these also are not just muslin you've done stuff on the inside of these too right so oftentimes if you're doing like a dress you don't need to do a lining for any reason but in this case it was very important to add the lining because it's smaller than the external fabric, and that's what's going to create this big balloon shape because it's constricting it on the inside. I just love seeing this because it seems almost surgical to, to be able to look on the inside and to see the construction of what makes it beautiful on the outside. Can you guess what the next step is? If you know what it is, say it out loud. That's right. I have to try this on. Right? Okay. Let's do it. <laughs> and you're ready to try it on? Yeah, ready to try it on. So, shall I put the trunkles on first? Yes, definitely. Alexa? because the jacket is going to cover this waistband. So. so now what we're doing is the fitting of the toile, which is where for the first time after Alexa completed the toile, I'm going to try it on and she, as the knowledgeable tailor, is going to assess what she thinks of the pattern that she drafted. Okay, it's very exciting. <laughs> there we go. There we go. You can pull them up as far as you can. Okay. So these are the, called the canyons, right? Yes. And that's this part right here. Mm -hmm. So I'm liking the proportions um, that we have on the trunk hose themselves. It's nice poof. <laughs> but um, something I want to work in on is these canyons, which are the bands below your knee that keep it below your knee and hold it in place to um, push all that fabric out into that shape. 
that it's poofing out more because these... Because it holds it right there. Because oh, if it I fell see. down, it would be much straighter. Right, okay. So the alteration point on these ones is just the inseam. So I've only hand basted it up and used the biggest stitch on my machine so that I can easily open this back up for fitting. Oh. And in this case, I'm just going to fold it up. I'm just going to make that alteration by pinning it into place. How about that? That feels great. Great. And yeah, and it can still bend. So then eventually I'll go back to my paper pattern and I'll transfer that to the other side and I'll cut down what I have in the flat pattern so that it becomes that. Wow. So the reason we're doing this is because if we just took the paper pattern, put it onto our good cloth and cut it out, there could be grave errors that we wouldn't be able to fix, right? Exactly. Because once you've cut cloth and there are parts that you've taken away, you can't put them back together. So it's better to make all your adjustments now on the prototype. This is something I've never done before, like making a twill, but it makes so much sense to, to do all the hard work here. Mm -hmm. And then it's practice because you've sort of done it once most of the time. If you're making your own twill, that is. Right. Yeah. Okay, what's next? How are we feeling about the waist? Does it feel secure? It looks good to me, but can I have you turn around? Is it too tight? Is it too loose? It's not too tight. Uh, it looks good to me. It feels perfect, actually. Okay, good. Like, when yes. I sit down and my stomach expands, it, it's more constricted, but it's still not uncomfortable. Would you like it to come out a tiny bit so that... No. Okay. I think it's great. But yeah, it's always important to try to do the movements that you think you'll be doing yeah. in the costume. Sitting. I think you'll be dancing a lot. Sitting, dancing. <laughs> yeah, I can really move around in this. Sitting's the big one. I just want to see if I'm... Yeah, it's fine. Perfect. Yeah, because those two anchor points are really important to just keeping that volume the way it is. Okay. So that means let's move on to the jacket. It's exciting. Would you like to... Sure. And these were oh. cut very close to the body. Yes, so it's so. really, really tight. So, oh, can you get your hand through or do you need me uh, to undo? I think I can actually. Okay. There we go. How did they do this by themselves? They didn't. <laughs> <laughs> if I had a, you would have a manservant right there. There we go. There we go. Beautiful. Wow. wow. I, how would I have done that by myself? <laughs> Wait, how do I get it off? Well, you always have somebody to take it off you. <laughs> oh, so handsome. How does, it, how does it, I haven't seen myself. How, how does it, how do you think? You look really good. <laughs> but you said you wanted it tight, so yep. I made it tight. Okay. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna step into the mirror. Okay. Wow. I, I feel like I'm, I've gone back in time. What do you think, Alexa? I think <laughs> I made a very good fall. Um, it fits you really well. Yeah, it's beautiful. Look how smooth this is compared to the mannequin that it didn't quite fit because it didn't even close on the mannequin, but like we're getting a nice back curve and the fabric is just like not wrinkling. Oh, lovely. I think the only place where it feels a little too tight is right mm -hmm. here. I just feel like my boobies are being too squeezed right now. <laughs> like, you know, the big torches. <laughs> <laughs> so I can see that with the way it's straining right here. So the way we're going to fix that is by going from the only alteration point, which is the side back seam right here. Because these jackets are only four panels. The mm -hmm. front, which, do you want to raise your arm and show? There's no actual side seam here. Oh. Oftentimes a side seam is where you're going to do your alterations. But because this is one piece that flows gently to the back and then you just have your back panel, we're only going to make alterations by bringing it out or bringing it in right on the seam. I also have to open up 
the seam of the armhole, because you alter one thing, it makes alterations for a whole bunch of other things too. And what I've done is made this with lots of seam allowance to accommodate for that. And in fact, I'm gonna have to take off the wing on this side because this is just something for style and that's gonna be in my way otherwise. And that was just hand sewed on. Sorry, can I have you turn? So that I could take it off easily. Surgical. Surgical. So this is how I'm bringing it out. I've decided that I only wanna bring it out from the front of the body and not this back. And then zeroing it out is when you bring it back to where the original seam was and that's what I wanna do. I wanna zero it out at the waist because it was in a good place at the waist. Anything else? I think something that I wanna play with is the point of this here because looking at our reference, it's way more dramatic. Look at that. Oh yeah. yeah. And that was something I wanted to look at in relation to your body as well because it's just, it changes depending who's wearing the garment and if the dress mannequin's different size than you, then it's gonna look a bit different. Yep. So I'm, this is considered a style line. It's purely for aesthetic. So uh -huh. I'm just going to draw it in figure out what we like. Starting from here, I think I'd like to make it more dramatic by bringing it up like this. And it starts to become a horizontal straight line to the body around here. So I'm going to try to zero it out around this tab. And again, it's just a note for me later when I transfer it to my paper pattern. Oh yeah. It looks so much more dramatic. Yeah. And then the other thing I want to change is how these tabs are crossing over each other. And that was another fit thing that you can't just guess at because if you notice, they come to this beautiful point oh. even though they cross over each other right. and don't quite have it at that. They're kind of skew whiffy from each other. Wow, you're paying attention <laughs> to even that. Yep. It's all about the details. There we go. Yeah. And then copy it to the other side so that it comes down to a beautiful point. Okay. So that's our 12 fitting? So that's the 12 fitting. So I have all the information I need to move forward now. And you'll take this. And I'm going to transfer all that info to a paper pattern. So I have to take this apart and mm. see the alterations that we made. And then I'm going to write those down on a paper pattern so that that can be cut in the real cloth. And then I take that paper pattern and begin to make the costume. But now, after being here and seeing your tables, I might just ask Alexa if she'll cut the cloth. <laughs> <laughs> Alexa, this is absolutely thrilling. That This idea that I had in my head, I don't know, like 15 years ago for my next Halloween costume has finally started to take shape and that it actually looks so good. You know, I do these things sometimes on a whim, they're wild goose chases, but this actually feels like I'm doing it properly, seeking out someone who not only really knows what they're doing, but that is so passionate about it. Because I, from the moment we met at the coffee shop, I could feel that you were enthusiastic about what you do. And it just shows, like this, as I said, this feels like a person, Mr. Doublet here. Uh, and. I, I just am so excited to actually get started on the sewing part of it. So thank you so much. Of course, it's been a pleasure. Thanks. <laughs>